introduction and thank you for uh, joining us in the uh, OI Tele Echo and uh, for today's topic of dental and orthodontic issues in OI. And we have uh, Jean-Marc Retrouvé uh, giving the talk and also the uh, cases at the end. And Jean-Marc has been uh, or, or was the uh, director of uh, orthodontics at McGill uh, for many years uh, here in Montreal. And uh, then he moved uh, to Kansas City. Uh, where he continues uh, working very actively on uh, issues related uh, to OI, uh, as you will hear in this presentation. So Jean-Marc, uh, please start. I'm going to unmute myself a bit. Yeah, thanks Frank and Michael for the invitation. And um, I will talk today about orthodontics in the age of aligners, but I will also show you a little bit of why we do this and what the limitations and I got only 30 minutes, so I'm gonna start right away. By the way, the picture in the back is one of our patients uh, from Georgia that uh, myself and Frank, we saw about two or three years ago, and he gave me permission to do all these 3D printing from him. He's a very nice kid, so he's an OI3, I think. Okay, so why do we do this? It's because quality of life is important. I go to all the uh, OI foundation uh, meetings, uh, medical, and I meet a lot of nice people. And about, I don't know, two or three years ago and more with a good student of mine from uh, McGill, we were lucky to be able to uh, look at malocclusion uh, and OI. And actually we made the uh, cover of the Journal of American Dental Association in July of 2020. And that has helped us a lot to get awareness uh, of patients with OI because malocclusions, uh, unlike what people think sometimes is, yes, you have a nice smile or you, you, you know, a little bit of crooked teeth, but a lot of these uh, subjects in WebOI actually have also some significant uh, functional uh, problems because they just can't chew. And that's an important aspect of what we can do. So I was very uh, in, impressed and interested by what Dr. Tosi has done for us for many years about quality of life. And I was surprised that the dental aspect of the impact of quality of life in adult patients was very high and it doesn't mean that the rest is not don't get me wrong but uh for every day and you know little pains if every one of you has dental pain it's not fun and oh i oh i uh, subject do suffer a lot from dental issues not just orthodontics by the way and i've learned to discover that through all my work at mcgill and now the moment at UMKC, we're just starting a new program. So we haven't seen too many OI patients. I'm going to Nebraska next week, actually, I think, to meet some, uh, some, uh, some people who have a large center there. So that was an interesting finding. And dental is definitely a part of the, um, I would say, in, in an important aspect of what we do. So these are two of my patients. One is, uh, made a joke about, I put braces on him and he, he sent me this picture. So I use it because I think it's pretty cute. You'll see him later on. And the other patient on the right-hand side is the daughter of the Canadian president. And we did some treatment on her also. And on the, in the middle, you can see the intro scanning machine that we use for the, uh, these patients. And uh, so that's, I think that new technologies have considerably uh, increased the amount of treatments we can deliver to these as a patients, and it's uh, really interesting that every day is a better day for, for, for us with 3D printing and simulation, which is not the talk for today. But 80% of individual, sorry, do present significant malocclusions. What is very interesting also in OI, I would say, is <clears throat> depending on the type of OI, you would have what we call, if it's a type one, and I assume that everybody knows the type, so I'm not gonna bug you with this, but type one, type three, and type four are the most common ones. The type ones are the most moderate patients. And I would argue they can be treated in any uh, orthodontic office, the majority of them, because they have less bone, but the bone is fairly okay. Obviously the type threes and the type fours do present some significant problems. Uh, with Dr. Rush, we published on type five about two or three years ago. And um, uh, the, these uh, types do present significant malocclusions, they have a lot of missing teeth, but it's not the talk for today, but uh, the six and seven, sorry, uh, are a little bit less involved in malocclusion wise, craniofacial wise. I'll show them to you in a minute. But the, the concept is really to concentrate on type threes and fours. And we have a, 
a study again with Dr. Uh, Rausch and Dr. Lee at uh, the NIH to look at moderate malocclusions uh, with patients uh, affected with or subject affected with type threes and fours. So basically, if you go from the left to the right, and I lost my pen, I do apologize. I'm done with it, yes. So that's my little patient you just saw on the, on, on the uh, iPhone. That's a patient you will see, that's my case presentation. That's a type four. This patient here is a type four, but he has some significant growth of the lower jaw, which is kind of unusual. And he will uh, one day get uh, some surgery, I guess, but you can see that the chin point has gone forward. Then the type, we have a type three, which shows the typical triangular face. And she also, as you can see by the smile, she also presents significant uh, malocclusion. So usually the type threes have the most severe malocclusions. The type fours are in the middle and the type ones, as you can see here, is not that severe. These types are different. That's another patient of mine. They all give me permission to publish, by the way. So this, this is a, a lady from Florida. She had braces twice and she will get uh, actually uh, get orthognathic surgery uh, from Dr. Napoli. I think, uh, I don't know when exactly, but uh, she had, we, we tried braces twice on her. We failed twice. So I think the, the skeletal uh, discrepancy was just too high. That's actually an interesting lady. She's from Quebec. She's very funny. She's an, she's a, a, an artist. And funny enough, you can see at a, at, at a smile, she has a great smile. She's type six, she has 150 fractures. So she had significant OI. But if you look at her smile, which was never treated, it's per almost perfect. So that's, that's a type six, which is kind of less uh, usual. That's again, a type seven. Uh, this one is a type seven, I think. And this is type seven again. And you can see this little lady does not really require any orthodontic help. So we concentrated on type threes and fours because I think they are the types that require the most attention. And I will go like this. Now that's my first patient. Uh, I did this, pa I treated this patient with Dr. Glovio a long, long time ago in 2008. And uh, I didn't know what to do at the time. I never seen too many OI patients in my life in the Montreal uh, children. So I became the world expert immediately because um, that was one of the first patients we treated. But you see what I like, and these patients I've been following for, I saw her last time in 2019. So it's been 11 years of follow-up. And you can see what really is unusual for the uh, OI population is this massive open bite that keeps the back teeth apart and you just can't chew. If you try tonight to put a piece of, I don't know, something on your front teeth and try to only bite on your front teeth, you will find out very quickly that your mastication power is really reduced. So we did braces on her. Uh, I was I brought back the teeth. You can see that right here. We brought her, we gave her some occlusion, and then we had to put a little overdenture here, which at the time was designed uh, in an analog fashion. And that's a project we have. I think we'll, we'll do it in the future with 3D printing, and it's going to make a massive difference in the quality of life of this patient. So that's why I always use this patient because she's my first one, and uh, we stayed even almost friends. And uh, it was important for her to be treated, and she was very happy. Um, so what happens is this is the typical uh, malocclusion. Well, you don't see this in, an, in a, in, I would say, an affected population. They are very difficult to treat because obviously the bone also does not respond very, um, I would say, predictably because have some, some patients have treated, I didn't treat too many, mind you, but the ones, some patients that treat, the teeth move very well and other ones, the teeth didn't move that well. So it's still a bit of a mystery on uh, what we can do. And it's always, always predictable. You find these types of malocclusions in type ones, uh, five and six, they are smaller. Uh, they can be treated, as I said. So the threes and fours are the ones we'll talk more. So that's a type one patient. And you can see even type ones have the eye. You can see the palpable calcification. So the teeth are fully calcified almost. That's the type of malocclusion. So it's not really that severe. And I would argue that despite the fact that this patient has DI, first of all, doesn't need, really need orthodontics. And second of all, uh, the malocclusion is not severe, even if the teeth are fairly severely affected at this moment. You can see this, the, molar, the molar roots are very short already, and they will resorb. This is something we don't quite understand. They will break, and they will also lose root length. And then it becomes a bit of a problem with age. So DI is a slowly... It's a slow process, 
but it keeps uh, getting worse with age. And now we look at the type four. Uh, and by the way, that's an article published by, uh, I think with Dr. Ross also on, uh, in, the, in the journal Bone that we just published. So this, this one is a DI. You can see the teeth start to be a bit more deformed. You can see also the DI is there. Uh, you can start to see the malocclusion here. The open bite is starting to form slowly, but this patient is not too affected except for the difference between the upper and the lower. She, oh, he or she still has some function. So that's except for aesthetic problems and the eye, it's not really, really bad. We can do some, some good orthodontics. This patient is a type three, and you can see immediately that now the teeth are poorly formed. That's a premolar. That's another one, it's this way. There is one missing here, and that's a problem. And you see the roots are very short and very narrow and very deformed. So uh, this becomes a very significant issue for us. And the amount of correction, orthopedic correction is very big. And a patient like this one, I would argue, I cannot treat at the moment. I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable enough. So the DI, to speak very quickly about DI, we've all heard about it. The teeth can be brown or grayish. It's the, what is the most important uh, aspect of DI? It's actually the inside of the tooth that is affected. The enamel by itself, which is the outside is not really bad. It just breaks because it has no support. So it's very difficult to treat uh, patients like this because their teeth are very, very, very fragile. Again, depending on the uh, severity of the malocclusion, and we found out that actually the lower incisors, which are those four, front four teeth here, are the most affected. And you can see that's, uh, that's again, the typical open bite is opening slowly. The teeth, this is a baby tooth, it will fall off, that's okay. And these patients at that level, we could still treat. Problem is, if you want to put a bracket on the tooth and do the regular, you know, braces thing, when you take re-putting the brackets is not a problem, as I told you, because the enamel is normal and we etch the brackets. I mean, we etch the enamel to uh, bond the brackets. The problem is when you want to remove the brackets, you take the enamel with it, which is not really what we want to do. So what at the end of the day, we can't really use brackets on these patients. So again, there are also some little problems. Uh, that's, that's one of my patients too with my hygienist when I was in Montreal. They have misshapen teeth as I showed you. So this tooth here, you see the root is not really good. Uh, this one is kind of shaped this way. So it's not again, a very unpredictable. Again, if it's just a misshapen it would be too bad, but you have to take this into account when we treat the patient. The biggest problem is, oh, sorry, I want to show you this. You see this tooth here, if I remember well, looks not so bad, but really it's completely turned on its side. When we take a cone beam CT, which is a 3D imaging, as you know, so this becomes an impossible tooth to bring into the arch. I cannot do this rotation. So the impacted teeth in OI subjects are impacted, but they are almost impossible to bring into the arch because their position is really, really, really unfavorable. Unlike a an affected patient where we just put a piece of, you know, elastic and we pull on the tooth slowly and the tooth will come in on, on the OI subjects, it becomes very challenging and almost impossible. You have also missing teeth. That's one of our patients too. Uh, he or she, I can remember, I think that's a he, missing a lot of teeth. So all, the, all these uh, little uh, stars are missing, showing missing teeth. And obviously when he or she gets, I think it's a he, when he, he gets older, We'll have some problems because those baby teeth will fall off and they will have some significant holes. And then we'll talk about implants another time, but putting dental implants in OI subjects may be actually a little bit unpredictable, more than a little bit actually. So what happens is the craniofacial presentation is very variable. That's why I took these eight cases. You can see this patient, except for this extended width, is, looks almost normal. Uh, this one now is an open bite in the anterior aspect and is very, very wide. And that's a type four, by the way. Uh, and this patient here shows a significant open bite right here. And that's a four two. And you can see that it's very unpredictable to uh, differentiate between threes and fours at the craniofacial level. So we use a, a, an index of malocclusion instead of, of the, uh, the, the, the threes and fours. But usually, as you know, the threes would be the, the three, uh, the type threes would be more affected as you can see these two uh, patients right here, this one and this one. 
and this one. So it makes our treatment options much more complicated. So that's the craniofacial characteristics. I'm showing you this, my, one of my favorite patients. We do fusion, we remove the teeth. We look at all the uh, possibilities of, oh, that's, oh, sorry. Let me play it again. I wanted to show you something. I'll stop it right here. So that's the dental problem. That's the, the way the teeth are. Oh, I can't, oh, sorry, I can't get it. So anyways, what I wanted to show you was these patients are actually also affected, a lot of them with a sleep apnea. So we don't know if it's obstructive, if it's central. So that's some study, I think over 20% of the patients are affected by sleep apnea issues. So I think there is a lot of studies to be uh, conducted there. But for the discussions for today, this is, I wanted to show you first the orthodontic aspect. Sorry, I'm getting some issues here. Um, some orthodontic aspect is my little patient. You see an OI type one, even if he had frequent fractures, and I don't remember, to be frank with you, if he was on bifosphonates, I don't think so. And that's one of my patients we decided to treat the other small crossbite, but it's a very simple malocclusion. So that's requiring some orthodontics. He doesn't even have the eye. So that's the simplest form of treatment I could show you. The only problem he had was he has very little overbite, so he could grow they tend to grow more and become more class three uh, with age. But we, we, we tried with elastics to get his, his um, to keep him, you see, as elastics in his mouth. So I'm trying to create as much, uh, we call this overjet, as much distance between the upper and lower jaw as possible to overcompensate for the potential uh, growth pattern that is unfavorable. So he's been a very cool little patient and he's wearing what we're telling them to do. We're telling him to do, he's very nice. And we finalized the, the treatment. It's not perfect, but it's still pretty good. So he's finishing in about two, two years of treatment and he has his straight teeth, everything is fine. So definitely OI type ones and that's him. So definitely type OI type ones can be treated, not a problem. And he was, the only problem was having with him is this part here. So if it starts coming forward, then the teeth don't match anymore and don't match anymore. And that's a big problem. That's a bit of a more complicated one. <clears throat> We've been treating her for a while and you can see she has the typical open bite. She also has just a touch of, and that's gonna be a case presentation later on. So I'm gonna show you what we did. And what happens, she only touches on these two front teeth. The rest is not touching. And she has the gray uh, DI and she's a type four and she's only 14 years old. Uh, sorry, 16 years old. But if we look here, I don't think she's going to grow anymore. And she's barely, uh, she has very, uh, not very good occlusion for mastication. But I don't think the growth is pretty much done and we should be okay. So let me see if I can show you. So what we decided for this, uh, this patient is to give her aligners because I could not do any type of uh, therapy with braces unlike the other patient, which I use as an example. And what we first do is uh, we do, uh, we use a, that's an old machine. It's my old Itero machine, which is an intro scanner. We have much smaller machines now, but that was four or five years ago. So what we do, we do a scan, which is this. And that's not this patient, by the way. And what happens, you have a virtual set of models in 3D that's created using, it's basically STL technology, which is stereolithographic uh, files, which are virtual models. And then what happens is, then I have to get out of here. I do apologize. Uh, let me stop them, I don't need them. Uh, let, me, let me go here. And I need to show you, uh, hopefully it's gonna work, yes. So that's basically the clean check. So the clean check is, the technology that allows us to mimic a treatment. So you can see on the lower here, we have the little red things or little buttons we'll be adding to the teeth to get the plastic to hold better. And on the right hand side, we have treatment plans. I'm not going to bug you because I'll do it with treatment plans in, 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 the, in the future. But you see nine means I had nine times. I went back nine times to the company to say, well, change, please change things, change that. And at the end, this is what we got. So now, Every time I move the little scale down on the bottom of the screen, you can see that we are very optimistic and we are bringing the teeth 
And you can also see that the teeth are not touching anymore because the upper arch and the lo lower arch are basically treated separately. So they don't fit anymore. So what I'm doing, I'm aligning the uppers, I'm aligning the lowers, and all of a sudden you're gonna see magic will happen right here. Pop. So now the software, which is uh, getting better because this 37 you see here, uh, we will definitely in the future have the, um, sorry, the, um, this jump in the bite will be done uh, as we go. So that's what we are looking for. So now she has, obviously we didn't move this baby tooth. We didn't move this tooth, which is too, too, too crowded. The blue things here are for the elastics. I'll show them to you later on. And now she has a bite. It's not perfect by far, but that's the best the company could do, okay? So that's our case with um, the simulation. The black dots tell me that the, the, the company feels that this is not going to happen because first time I ever sent an OI uh, clean check, which is this simulation, they called me back and said, uh, what are you doing? We can do this for you. And I said, yes, you will. And they, they've done it since then. And we've done a few cases and they all worked okay. All right, so that's that's the clean check. So basically when you will hear about Invisalign in the future, even for non-OI, this is what we do. We simulate the treatment, which is obviously a lot of movement here, way too much, but the simulation will help us get to a certain level. And then we will rescan the patient and start over again. So let me go back to my PowerPoint, which I've lost. I think it's right here. Yes, uh, no, sorry. Uh, where am I? No, that's not the right one. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, I'll be back. Okay, so I think, oh, come on. Okay, I should be back here. Slideshow. And from the current slide. So that's what I showed you. Remember, we did this patient here. We sent it to the company by doing the scan. And then we did the clean check. And then we produced what we call the aligners, which are all these. Uh, let's, that would be number one, number two, number three, number four. They all program. And theoretically, at the end of treatment, the teeth should be aligned. So that's, that's the concept of Invisalign or any type of aligners. This patient here, I'll show you again, I have to get out of this. So that's my favorite, one of my favorite patients. You can see that this patient here now presents or subject presents a very significant open bite. The only, this time is different from the other one. He only touches on his back teeth. So what we did again, and I'll do, apologize, I have to get out of here again and hopefully I'll do better this time. Um, uh, we'll present you this guys right here. So that's, that's the presentation that he had. You can see it goes to 50 aligners, which is a ton. But eventually the plan would be for these patients or these subjects is to not correct the malocclusion at all. All we do is we're going to put the teeth into a better position, which would be somewhere in here. And then we have a better position of the teeth. And then we can do what we call an overdenture. We will use the, the teeth as a support to do a 3D printing prosthesis, which would fit much better. Because the problem we have right now is a lot of people try to do the prosthesis on this setup and it just doesn't work. So that's the plan that the next, the next plan would be to improve the tooth position in this probably here, and then start making a better, I would say, a better setup that will be more comfortable for the patient. So that's called a hybrid uh, approach. And at the moment, we still haven't done too many. I'm just uh, experimenting with this. So yes, uh, so we are here. So this is a, a case I would consider too complicated for Invisalign only, it's too much. And a lot of my uh, patients ask me, can you please treat me? And I say, well, I don't think it's a good idea, but with the hybrid approach, I think we'll have some, some success. So what's, what's happening is the in-house aligners, that's another patient we've been looking at. And this time uh, she was too small. We could not, uh, oh, we could not get uh, the, uh, the Invisalign aligners to fit. So what we've decided to do 
is to do in-house aligners ourselves. So what we did, <coughs> Invisalign will not do this for us. So what, what we did with a friend of mine, we did the STL files, we cut the STLs, we separated them, and then we reversed engineer everything, which is on the right-hand side. So by reverse engineering, I mean that we basically separated these uh, segments in a very, I would say, amateurish way right now, but we hope to improve with age. And eventually what we did, we got six millimeters of expansion because the, the, the patient had a very, very small upper jaw and we wanted to make sure that we had what we needed to do. And that's basically, if I can play this, so you can see that's the before and we, something should appear. Yeah, so that's the after. And the, the pink shows us how much we want to get of expansion. It's uh, called mesh mixer software. So this is the superimposition of the before and after. And there was about six millimeters of expansion here done. Now the teeth came from this position to this position. I was able to move them. The canines came out. And that's a patient I do, we call this by proxy in the sense that I help the orthodontist who is in Florida. And we are working on this patient. Unfortunately, I asked him to give me the latest photos and he did not. So I do apologize. So that's what the idea. See, we went from this width. We were able to erupt the tooth. We were able to turn the teeth. And yes, there are teeth missing here, but there are baby teeth that fell out. And this was when we did the first set of aligners. I think we did about 12 and we got about four millimeters of expansion, which is not enough, but we did a second set. And again, I do apologize. I didn't get the, uh, I didn't get the, uh, how can I say? The second set of records on time. Hopefully by July, I have them. Now he tells me that it's much nicer and the patient now seems to be able to have enough teeth in the mouth. So that was a good treatment, but that was using in-house aligners. In-house is the same as Invisalign, except I do everything myself. It's kind of a homemade system, okay? So that's, that concludes my presentation. It was 30 minutes. I don't know if I went too fast or if there are some questions and uh, I will uh, do the case presentation later. Okay, thank you very much, Jean-Marc.